All right, welcome to the second half of the final review. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to just go through all this, all these topics. There are so many. I have to go through them quickly because we don't have all the time in the world, unfortunately. So uh, if anything, I don't spend enough time on, if there's anything like that, uh, do come to office hours, yell at me, and we'll make it make sense. Okay, so let's talk about counting. Lots and lots of things here to talk about. So. Uh, the first thing that we learned was the product and sum rules, and these kind of like helped us learn the rest of the topics of these chapters. Okay, so they're kind of two intuitive rules. The product rule is like, okay, if I have like I have thing one and thing two that I want to do. This is the first thing. This is the second thing. There are two ways to do the first thing and three ways to do the second thing, and I'm going to do both. Okay, if they're separate actions, there are two times three ways total of performing each, action A, action B. See? That's all. So there's six things that we can do. I could do this one and this one. I could do that one and this one, that one and this one. I think you get the idea. Or I can do this one and that one. Okay, so six ways total. That's the product rule. Then we have the sum rule. Okay, so this is just saying, okay, I don't want to do two things at once, or multiple things, I just want to do one thing still. So if there are A ways of doing one thing, and B ways of doing another thing, and we're trying to pick it just one thing to do, then I can either do this one, or this one, or this one, they're all separate things, it's A plus B, five things. Okay? Five things total to, to pick, to do. Okay, so that's the product and sum rules, and that helps us learn about permutations. So a permutation is just how we can rearrange things. So for example, if I want to permute the elements of this set, uh, one, two, three, four, there are a bunch of different ways to do it, and those ways are usually uh, referenced using tuples. So like, I could just leave them alone. That's one permutation. I could uh, do this one, one, two, four, three. I could swap those. I could do uh, one, three, two, four, I could do one, three, four, two, etc. So the, those are all the different permutations of this, and the question is how many are there? How many ways are there to permute something? Uh, there are exactly n factorial ways, okay? If you want to permute n elements, there are n factorial ways to do it, okay? That's all. And sometimes you have a set and you want to permute elements of it, but you don't want to permute every element. So maybe we only want to permute, uh, um, might as well type this, permute r sized tuples out of n elements. Okay? So what are all the, let's just say counts, all the r-sized tuples of n elements. That makes the most sense. So p of, for example, p of uh, 4 comma 3 is all the three tuples, all the triples of these four numbers in this set. Okay, that's how we count them. So this is, uh, let me name some of them. It's like, okay, you have 1, 2, 3, you could have 1, 2, 4, you could have uh, one, let's see here, one, three, two, you could have one, four, two, on and on and on and on until the end of time. Uh, but there is a limit. How many of these are there is the question. And the answer is a nice little formula. So PNR, it's just, okay, I have first, or initially, now let's do P43. I have initially, like for the first element of this tuple, I have four things to choose from. So the answer is four. And then for the second one, I've used this one already. I can't use one anymore. I have how many left? I have three left. And then for this third one, I've used two things. I can't repeat them. How many options do I have left out of the four? Well, I have two left. So that is the answer here. And so it just so happens that there are just as many <laughs> three tuples as there are four tubules. Isn't that weird? That is interesting. 
because uh, the number of four tuples is four times three times two times one. That's the beauty of it. There's always only one left, and so it, it makes no sense to, uh, there's no need to include it. You know what would have to have gone there. Isn't that fun? So that's your little formula. Uh, that's the idea. So that's uh, PNR. Next, we have combinations. So we have a set of things that we want to count all the different ways that we can make a subset out of that set. So like, if again, we had a set that was one, two, three, four. If you want to make all the different size two subsets of this, there are quite a few, right? There is, you got your one, two, you got your uh, one, three, you got your one, four, you got your two, three, right? Not two, one, because I already counted that one. It's already up here. It's a set, remember? So that, that kind of changes how we count all this stuff, OK? So combinations, they count subsets. And so if you want to count all of the uh, R size subsets, out of an n element set, size of original set, let's say. You do CNR, which is pronounced uh, n choose r in this notation. So I was asking here for 4 choose 2. And uh, you can follow this these rules to, to solve it, but it, it makes the most sense just doing it this way. It's like, OK, I have. Uh, I want to make all the tuples of two things. So that's there's four times three of those tuples, and then I don't want to overcount. And so, uh, because there's two things, I want to divide by all the different ways of arranging those two things. So two factorial, which is just two times one. Okay, so that is four choose two. That's all the different subsets of size two of a size four set. Okay, that's combinations. Uh, there is also permutations with repetitions and uh, counting multisets. So those are two separate things, right? Uh, so permutations with repetitions is like, I'm trying to scam scramble the, like, I don't know. What's a good word? What's a good example word? I'm not sure. We did Mississippi before, right? That, that sounds complicated though. Let's do Beyonce again. Like, what are all the different ways to scramble Beyonce? And uh, the way that you can do that is to notice like how many things do you have repeated you have two e's that are repeated and then the rest of these letters are not repeated and so the idea is there's always there is a fancy formula go ahead and look at that if you want but the idea is to notice that there are slots to fill for every permuted word right it has uh one two three four five six seven different characters in this string after you permute it. And so it's your job to pick, OK, where do I want to place all these values? That's the idea. OK, where do I want to place the B? Where do I want to place the E? How many options are for all of these things? OK, so the idea is let's place these E's first. And the realization is, like, there's no difference between the first E and the second E. So like this and this from the first E and the second E versus this and this from the first E and the second E. It's the same string. So we don't want to double count. Okay, So that should scream combinations. How many ways are there to choose the two indices to put these E's out of 7? OK, that's 7 choose 2. Make sense? And then once I've placed the E's somewhere, I have the rest of the characters to worry about. How many ways are there to scramble the rest of them into the rest of the spaces? And because there are uh, one, two, three, four, five left, and I can permute any of them in any order because they're all separate, the answer is just times five factorial. OK, so that's word scrambling. Uh, and then we have counting multisets. And multisets are a bit weird. They are. Uh, they look like sets, but they're not. It's like one, two, two, three is not equal to, in multi-set world, one, two, three. Okay? 
That is quite odd, I know. Uh, yes, we're still recording, good. So that's all about if we want to pick from a, a certain number of varieties. If we want to pick n things from m varieties, and we can pick as many things as we want from a certain variety, right? So we can pick seven chihuahuas if we wanted to, but we don't have to. There's like an infinite number in each type. It's like a big basket that we can take from. So uh, the way that you do that is this formula. So if you want to know exactly how many ways to pick seven dogs from five types, it's just seven plus five minus one over m, uh, which is five minus one. Choose five minus one. That. Uh, so 12, 11, choose four. But why do we have that? The answer is the way of choosing like dogs from types is equivalent, remember, to a binary string. It's like, okay, I want three dogs of the first type. And then I'm ready to pick from the next type, so I'll put a zero. I want two dogs from the second type. And then I want, uh, I don't know, I'm at five. I want one dog from the third type, one dog from the fourth type, and then I'm good on dogs, I don't need anything from the last type. So this exactly encodes what we want. I want uh, three dogs from this type, from the first type, two dogs from the second type, one dog from the third type, and one dog from the fourth type, no dogs from the, z from the fifth type. This is encoded perfectly in a binary string with just ones and zeros, and the uh, what we're choosing is, like, how do we count the different numbers of binary strings that look like this? We just have to pick the spots from the zeros, for the zeros, because we know exactly where the ones will have to go after that, okay? We know we have to make a string of size seven plus five minus one. Oh, sorry, I th is it seven plus five minus one? Yeah, because there's always one less, I think. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, we don't need this last zero. That's why, it is seven plus five minus one. Just like we don't need an initial zero. That's the idea. And then we want to pick where to put the four zeros. That's all. Which indices. So that's how you count multi-sets. Uh, yeah, hopefully this is all coming back to you. It's fun stuff. It's a bit different from programming, but it's helpful when we're like talking about algorithm analysis when you get into an upper division class about that. Okay, that brings us to binomial coefficients. So uh, a binomial coefficient, it's just if you expand something, right? You do a plus b to the three, that's going to equal a bunch of stuff. It's a times a times a plus uh, a times a times b plus a times b times a plus dot dot dot. There's a lot of them, all the way to b times b times b. There's a few different options here, right? And the idea is all of these come together. Like here's in these two are equivalent, right? That's the idea. You got two a's and a b. That's a squared b. We have two of them. How many? How many of them are there? How many a squared b's are there in this expansion is the question. And the binomial theorem tells us that. It's all about counting sets, OK, subsets. So if we want to know what is the coefficient of a, k, b, and money's k, so let's, let's pretend we're talking about a squared uh, b to the 1. What's the coefficient out in front of this when we expand a plus b to the 3? Well, it's just going to be uh, n choose k. So it was 3, 3 total, and then k is the first one, 3 choose 2. That's the number that goes there. OK, that is the idea. So it's 3 times 2 over 2 factorial, which is just 2. So it's 3. There are apparently 3 of them. That is the idea. That's what the binomial theorem gives to you. OK, it's equal to that. And uh, there's also an identity. It's saying that this is also equal to this. And that's where you get the, uh, the Pascal's triangle out of 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1. It's, it's, it's a palindrome. It reads the same forwards and backwards. OK, so remember all that stuff, all that fun stuff. And that is your binomial coefficients. OK, moving on down to generating permutations and combinations now. This is uh, a fancy one. Oh, sorry, I missed this slide somehow. Generating permutations and combinations. 
And we do it the way that we know when we're done is we do it in order. We do it in lexicographic order, which is dictionary order. Okay? So you got all these silly functions that are long and confusing. Let me talk you through them. This, these ones should make sense. It's like, okay, here's the first permutation lexicographically. It's like A, B, C, all the way to Z. And then we're going to keep on outputting it and then calculating the next permutation and outputting that as long as uh, we're not at the end. We know what the last one looks like because it's in order. Same for subsets. We have the first one. We keep generating the next one and outputting it. Okay. It's these generating the next one functions that are difficult. So let me walk you through these in a nutshell, uh, all that you'll need to know. Uh, hopefully it should be helpful when you're implementing it for your lab as well. So let us talk about next perm. Let me, let me permute all the numbers from one to uh, four. Okay. And then let me, then we'll do the next thing for subsets. Let me show you like, this is the high level idea behind the next perm function. It's okay. You have a starting permutation and then you need to figure out what the next one is lexicographically. And here's the trick. You're like, okay, can I rearrange these last two? You try that to make a bigger tuple. The answer is yes. Like three and four, that's smaller than four and three. Hey, hey, that one's bigger. That's the next one. And then you play the same game. Can I rearrange these two to make a bigger tuple, bigger subtuple? And the answer is no. Okay. I guess I should say subtuple. The answer is no. So let's talk about the th these three then. Okay. Can I arrange these three to make a one uh, bigger, the next bigger subtuple? And the answer is yes. I can put the three first one, three. And then I have to make it as small as possible over here. And I have two and four left. So two, four, see that? That's the idea. That is the next lexicographically bigger permutation. You see that? You're always trying to make the smallest, bigger next tuple, which is a weird thing to talk about. So it can't be like, uh, four, two, three, or something like that. Four can't come first because three, uh, three is smaller than that. Okay. And so you just keep playing this game. Can I rearrange these two to make a next bigger subtuple? Yes. One, three, four, two. That's the next one. Can I arrange these two? No, we're done. We have to do this one again. Okay. So we have to look at these three. Can we make a bigger one? Yes. One, four, two, three. Okay. Make the next smaller one. It couldn't have been three, two. Okay. Let's look at this one. What's the next one? One, four, three, two. I can't arrange them this way. Let's look at this one. Can I make the next bigger one? Oh no, I cannot. Four through two is as big as we can get. See, now I have to look at these four. Okay. I have to look at the next four, the last four, which is all of them. Can I make a next bigger tuple? Yes. I can put two first now. Two, one, three, four. That's the next smallest one. Okay. Dot, dot, dot. So that's how you can generate the next permutation in your head. Uh, hopefully that makes some sense. And next subset is quite similar. Okay. So subset, I don't know. let's do subsets of one, two, three, four. Let's do, uh, I don't know, three subsets of them size, three subsets of the set one, two, three, four. So the first element is always one, two, three. And then we want to find the next subset in lexicographic order. And so, the idea is find the uh, first element from left, from right to left that could be bigger. I guess let's say find the rightmost element that could be bigger because I have these numbers to choose from. This three could be bigger. It could be four. Yeah. So that is the next one. Increase it. And then if there's anybody after it, we're going to do some stuff. One, two, four. Yeah, that's the next one. That's the next lexicographically ordered subset. Okay. What's the one that comes after this? What is the, what's the number that could be bigger? Not the four, but the two. That's the rightmost one that could be bigger. So we're going to increase it. And then what needs to come next is not two, because we've got this up here already. 
it's always uh, everybody that comes after this one that you flipped, that you increased, is always 1 plus the previous, plus 1. So now it becomes 4, 1, 3, 4. That's your next subset. Set everybody after it to 1 plus the previous one. OK, find the next number that could be bigger. Dun, dun, dun. Could this one be bigger? 4 definitely can't be bigger. Could this 3 be bigger? Could we make it a 4? The answer is no, because then there's nothing bigger to put after it. So now it's the 1 that needs to be bigger. OK, so we have to say 2. Oh, you're ready. So 2, and then what comes next? What in the world comes next? It is going to be uh, add 1 plus 2, 3, 4. See that? That is the idea. And so we've made, I think we're done, right? That's all the three subsets, because the last one is, yeah, it looks like that. So I think we're done. And let's let's confirm that we got the right size. For, so we should have had 4 choose 3 of them. That should be 4 times 3 times 2 over 3 factorial, which is 3. Uh, and that's times 2, right? 3 times 2 times 1, that's 3 factorial. Uh, so the 1 is unnecessary. But the 3s and 2s cancel, and we have 4 total. Yeah, we did it. OK, so it's always find the rightmost element that could be bigger, increase it, and then everybody else gets increased as well to be based on you, 1 plus the previous element. So that's how you generate all this stuff. Hopefully that helps when you're like trying to make sense of these things when you're implementing them for your lab. Uh, and then finally, in this chapter, we have the pigeonhole principle. That is the next highlight that I want to talk about. So the pigeonhole principle is a fun one. It's just saying, if you have three holes and four pigeons, p, 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 there has to be a hole, and you know that all four pigeons are in a hole, there has to be some hole that holds two pigeons, that holds multiple pigeons. They have to overlap, OK? And you can prove this by contradiction. It, otherwise, there would only be three pigeons, right? But no, there's four. So they have to double up. They have to overlap, OK? And this can be used to prove surprisingly powerful things. Some interesting concepts can be proved just from the pigeonhole principle. OK, so let's uh, let's do this one. So there is a this is a harder example. I won't like ask you this one on a test, but it's a fun one to talk about. So let's use the pigeonhole principle to show that uh, when we select eight numbers out of this set, eight numbers that Two of them that we selected must have summed to 15. We can use the pigeonhole principle to prove this. It's crazy, huh? We're going to select eight numbers out of the set 1, 2, all the way to 14. And we need to prove that two of those numbers that we picked, like maybe it was 14 and 1, there are two of them somewhere that add up to 15. Isn't that cool? So this is going to be true because let's, let's, sub, let's make all the subsets that add to 15 out of this set, original set. You got your 1 and 14, you got your 2 and your 13, you got your, I'm horrible at making those braces still, you got your 3 and your 12, you got your 4 and your 11, you got your 5 and your 10, you got your 6 and your 9, you got your 7 and your 8, and I think that's all, okay? So notice, we are picking eight numbers. How many of these subsets that sum to 15 are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, yeah. So no matter which eight numbers you pick, that one, 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 you can hold off as up to seven. But the second you pick an eighth number, it's got to be from one of these other sets, right? So if you pick 13, Job's done. It was 2 and 13, and 7 to 15. See that? Isn't that a fun little proof? Isn't that cool? Uh, there's only 7 subsets that sum to 15. And you're picking 8 numbers. Isn't that cool? All right, so that's the pigeonhole principle in a nutshell. Again, look at the slides, look at the lectures, look at the book. Uh, I can only give you so much, but this is like the the most bang for your buck, I hope. Okay, so now let's talk about probability. Let's go on to talk about all those many, many terms, again, as is usual in this class. So in probability, you have like an experiment. 
maybe you're rolling a die. And every experiment has a bunch of outcomes, like, okay, your die could be one, it could be two, it could be three, all the way to six. Okay, so that's an experiment. And then your sample space is just the set of all possible outcomes. So if you're rolling a die, like, your sample space is the number that comes up, one, two, through six. That's your sample space. Let's call it S or something. Okay, that is the idea. And an event is something that you're hoping to happen. Like, oh, I want to roll a small number, one, two, or three. That is just a subset of your sample space, that's all. And then you can have probability distributions, which take each outcome to the probability that that outcome will occur. Okay, so if you want to roll a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six, if you had a normal die, your probability would be the same. It would be all one sixth, right? Probability of rolling a four, probability of rolling a five, probability of rolling a six. If you had a loaded die, these would be a bit different. Something like that would have had to happen, right? But this is a nice little probability distribution. They don't have to look like that. They can look all wavy, but as long as they add up to one, that's the key, okay? You can only have probability one is always happens, right? So one of these has to always happen. That's the key. And then a uniform distribution is the kind of distribution that we love because every outcome, just like for rolling a die, or flipping a coin, it should have the same probability, right? It's all fair. Uh, and that's really helpful because we can divide by the total number of outcomes to get the, the real probability, right? So if I want to know, okay, what's the probability of rolling a two? Well, it's just, okay, that is, uh, or even for an event, what's the probability of rolling a one or two or a three? Well, it's all right, I have those three options out of six total. And because it's an uni because it's a uniform distribution, the probability is immediately three sixths, okay? Probability of that event is three sixths because of the fact that it's a uniform distribution. I can just divide by the total number. It's wonderful. All right, so that is intro, all the examples. For the next two slides, we'll be talking about conditional probability and Bayes, and for that, we need an example. So let's let's have this be our silly example. All right, so the probability that it's hot outside, uh, I'm just gonna assume that that's 0.5, depending on where you are on the Earth. I, I'm, I imagine that it probably evens, about, evens out to like the Arctic, the daytime, the nighttime, the tropics, all that. Let's pretend it's 0 0.5, and then we have this fancy notation. This means given. You read this as given. So this is saying the probability that it's hot outside, given that you live in Fresno. So we know that you live in Fresno. The probability that it's hot outside in Fresno is 0.99. Okay, I think that's mostly accurate. And then the probability, let's pretend that you live in Fresno. Uh, let's assume that it's a uniform distribution of where you are in the world, where you're born as a human. So there are 7.7 .7 billion people in the world and five, 530-ish uh, thousand people in Fresno. So that's your probability that you live in Fresno. All right, so that's our example. Let's use that to learn some cool stuff. Let's talk about conditional probabilities now. So conditional probabilities is, well, I've already shown you one, probability of something given something else. So if you know something that tells you information a lot of the time about some other property. Okay, that's quite nice. Things are linked a lot of the time. So uh, P of E given F is just the probability that E happens given that we knew that we know F has happened. Okay, that is the probability of them both happening over the probability of just F. Okay, so here's like the idea. It's uh, here is event E. We got all these things and then here's the problem here's the event F happening and there is some overlap dun, 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 dun. and so the probability of E given F is just the probability of their intersection divided by the probability of F total okay probably that F itself happens okay so that's that is the idea, okay? So uh, it's a bit weighted. So if you see E happening, it's quite likely that F also happened. You see that? There's a lot in the there's a lot in the intersection. So 
uh, you can use this. If I gave you this one, if I gave you P, it's hot outside, given you live in Fresno, what is P of it's hot outside and you live in Fresno? Intersect. What's that prob probability? Well, it's just 0.99, which was the conditional probability. That is equal to what we're looking for, P of hot intersect Fresno over P of Fresno, P probability that you live in Fresno. So if I just multiply 0.99 by, by the probability that you live in Fresno, I get the answer. Okay? So apparently that equals uh, 0.99 times this thing, that monster. So let's say P Fresno equals 5.3 e to the 5 divided by 7.7 7 e to the 9. And then I can just multiply these things. Oops, I accidentally put a dot there. There we go. And I'll just multiply that, P Fresno times 0.99. And so that's my tiny little probability. So 6.8 e to the negative 5. So that's a small probability that it's both hot outside and you live in Fresno, even though it's quite likely that it's hot outside when you live in Fresno. Okay. And it's because it's very unlikely for you to have lived in Fresno, right? That's the, that's the hope. Uh, and then independent events are quite nice. There are a bunch of different ways to talk about independent events, but all it's saying is that the probability of one thing does not affect the probability of another thing when those two things are independent, those two different events are independent. Then P of E intersect F is just equal to P of E times P of F. Okay. That's the idea. So let's see if uh, it's hot outside and you live in Fresno are independent events. Let's see. Is this the same as their multiplication? Dun, dun, dun. So we found this number. Is this number equal to 0 0.99 times 0 0.5? It is not. So these are not independent events. It helps to know that you're in Fresno to determine whether or not it's hot outside because there's a wide difference between those probabilities. Okay? They are independent events. Uh, that is the idea. So P of H and P of E. The events H and E, let's say, are not independent. All right. That's conditional probability. And we can use that in Bayes' rule. So Bayes' rule tells us if we know one way, if we know one conditional probability, and we know some others, like that one and that one, or potentially instead of this one, all this, then we can get the other way around. Okay? And there's an easy way to prove it. Just go back to the definition, write them out, and it should make sense. So, what is then, what is P of you live in Fresno given it's hot outside? It's just equal to P of it's hot outside given you live in Fresno times, times what? Times probability you live in Fresno over probability that you live, uh, I'm sorry, probability that it is hot outside. Okay, so let's do this. That is the probability. Probability that you live in Fresno given it's hot outside in this imaginary world. All right, so it is Hot outside given Fresno is 0 0.99 times P of Fresno, which we've typed and put into a variable, divided by probability that's hot outside, 0 0.5. So it's that number. And if we multiply it by 100, we'll get the percentage. So it's apparently this percent, 0.014 percent which is surprisingly bigger than I thought it would be, yeah? So, the probability that you live in Fresno given it's hot outside is not too shabby, given that there are billions of people in the world in this example. It's that 0.99, it's pulling a lot of weight. Isn't that fun? So that's Bayes' rule. And yeah, let's talk about random variables now, and we're getting towards the end. So, uh, a random variable, think of it like I don't know, 
Think of it like a, f a variable in a programming language where every time you try and access it, it gives you back a different value. Like if I had a random variable for like a die getting thrown, if I like print it once, maybe it'll print one. If I print it another time, it's random. So it'll maybe print three this time. And so it's just a random variable. That's the idea. Think of it like a programming language variable. Uh, mathematically, it's supposed to be a function. So like you can think of it as like a void function that runs random stuff. Uh, it's a function from the sample space of an experiment to the real numbers. So it always gives you back a number. A random variable always gives you back a number when you ask it for its value. OK, that's the idea. And then you have the range of a random variable. It's all the numbers that a random variable could take on. So uh, let's talk about this in terms of this little cute spinner example. So let's pretend that we want to make a random variable that represents the sum of the two spinners. So let's call it, uh, what's our random variable? What should it be? Uh, I don't know. I don't want to call it s because we were already using s to represent like a sample space. Uh, I don't know. Let's just call it y. Our random variable is called y. It's the sum of the two spinners. The range of it, because uh, let's talk about what, what the sample space is and then the range of our random variable. So the sample space is what are the outcomes? What are the, what are the possible uh, outcomes in our experiment? They are, remember we're like rolling a uh, spinner, we're, we're spinning a spinner, a blue one and a red one. So the, the outcome is whatever the values of each of them are. There. So either like the blue one was one, the red one was one, the blue one was one, the red one was two, Blue one was one, red one was three, or blue one was two, red one was one, blue one was two, red one was two, blue one was two, red one was three, and then so on and so forth with three being the first thing. Uh, so that's the sample space. And then the range of the random variable, because y is going to represent the sum of the two spinners. Well, what are all the different possible values that it could take on? Well, minimum one plus one, that's two. And then we could have three, four. And then if this one was a two, we could have five. The rest we keep getting. Uh, and then if this one was a three, we could have six. So that's the biggest number you can get. Anybody between two and six you can get. All right. So uh, our job is to like talk about all this stuff. OK. So the sample space slash the input to our random variable, it's always an element of our sample space. It's a blue spinner value and a red spinner value. OK. And then the range of our, uh, of our random variable, of our y, is this. It is those 2 through 6. And now we can find the distribution over this random variable. How often will it land on 2? How often will it land on 3? OK. That is the idea. So I guess we're going to have to write it all out, just so that we can see how often it's going to land on each of these. So 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3. OK. So the distribution of, all right, how many times can it be 2? So the count for 2, uh, count for 3 count for four, count for five, count for six. And then we can use that count to create a probability. OK, that is our goal. So how many different ways are there to spin the spinners and get two? There's only one way. Same for six, there's only one way. Now three, that way and that way, two ways. Right. And uh, now four. You got this one. You got this one. You got this one. Right? That's three. And then how many ways are there to get five? Um, two, three, or three, two. So that's two. Two, one. And I hope that works. 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, and there's nine. Yeah, cool. So the probability is just here one over nine, two over nine, three over nine, two over nine, one out of nine. Okay, that's the distribution over our random variable. And once we have that, we can talk about what is the value, what's like the weighted average of this random variable? What, what is the value that we should expect to get back whenever we like print it out or something? Over time, in the average, what is the value that we expect to see from our random variable? And it's just a weighted average. So go through every outcome, multiply the number that you get back from that outcome from the random variable, and then by its uh, probability that you see that outcome. Okay, and you can bring like outcomes together and talk about, okay, for every possible value that you get from your random variable, multiply that value by the probability that you see that value. That's the easier one to do. Let's use the two spinners again. So the expected value for the two spinners for their sum using this table is what? Let's use this one. It's just a weighted average. It's a it's gonna be the sum of some things. So it's gonna be one ninth times one. Or sorry, one ninth times two, that's the output. Output of the spinner. One ninth times two plus two ninths times three. Plus three ninths times four plus two ninths times five plus one ninth times six. Alright? So this is the answer, e of x, or our random variable is called y, right? It equals 1 ninth times 2 plus 2 ninths times 3 plus, uh, let's see, 3 ninths times 4 plus 2 ninths times 5 plus 1 ninth times 6. And because it's symmetric, I'm, I'm pretty sure that answer was 4, right? Uh, but we can confirm that. Plus three ninths times four plus two ninths five plus one ninth times six. Yeah, it was four. Okay. So yeah, that's the idea. That is expectation of a random variable. What number do you expect to see? Uh, this one makes sense because it's going to land on three the most. You expect to see the three in the average. But it would be different if you had a different distribution. Okay, the next thing is linearity of expectations. This is a nice time-saving tool to use, and these two equations follow from the definition of expected value. Okay, so we can make this actually a whole lot easier on ourselves because let us just make a single random variable for a single spinner. We have two of them. Right? two identical spinners, the value that we get back from one, we can use that. That can be our random variable. Okay, so let's make it. Uh, let's just make, I don't know, z be the random variable that is that represents the uh, the number on a spinner. on a single spinner because the expected value of the sum of two spinners should just be the expected value of z plus z or expected value of two times z. Let me show you all this. Okay, so what is the expected value of a single spinner? Right. So we just have this table again. You could get back a one, two, or a three from a spinner. And what's the probability that you did? Well, it's uniform, one third, one third, one third. What's the expected value of a single spinner? That's just one third times one plus two thirds times, two times one third plus three times one third. That's equal to two. And so you can use linearity of ex expectations to not have to go through this giant mess of a longer table when you know that each, each spinner can just be one random variable. 
and you have two of them. So I just want the expected value of, uh, of these. Expected value of two single spinners. Okay? And so that's going to be equal to, follow either of them, it's going to be two times two, or two plus two, and that's four. That's another way to get it, using linearity of expectations. Okay, yeah, so that is the idea there, and we are almost done, my friends. This is the last slide that I want to review. Uh, let's talk about Bernoulli trials. Okay, so this is a special kind of experiment. A lot of the time, uh, this applies to what we're doing. We either uh, succeeded in our, our endeavors, or we failed, okay? So an experiment with two outcomes is a Bernoulli trial, okay? You either have success or you have failure, and you know the probabilities of each, okay? And we want to talk about, like, how many ways, like, what's the probability of me getting exactly three successes and two failures out of a trial of five things, right? That's what we want. And the distribution of those successes slash failures in a bunch of independent Bernoulli trials, they have to be independent, they can't affect each other, otherwise the numbers don't make sense, uh, it doesn't work. This is called a binomial distribution, that's what it gives you, okay? So here's the long spiel from the slides. It's if you want to know the probability of getting exactly k successes after doing n total Bernoulli trials, you had k successes, probability of success is p, and probability of failure is 1 minus p or q. So this, these two exponents have to sum to n, because you had n things happening. Probability of k successes, this is the probability of the rest of them being failures, and then you have to multiply that by all the different ways that you could have had k failures and n minus k, or sorry, k successes and n minus k failures, because they could be ar rearranged. Like, if you're just trying to count how many times you got two heads out of three tries, it could be heads, tails, heads, it could have been head, head, tails, it could have been tails, head, head. So you have all of these options. It's three choose two. See that? That's the idea. So uh, that's why you multiply all those things. And so one last example. What is the probability that you get exactly three ones after rolling a die six times? So remember, success that is, you saw just a one. Failure is you saw any other number, two through six. So what's the probability of success? P equals one over six. Q, probability of failure, it's one minus that, or just probably this, it's five over six, okay? So what's the probability of getting exactly three ones after rolling a die six times? Like getting super lucky a lot of the time. That is going to be, well, we have six, six rolls. We wanted three successes, three ones. We're defining that as our success. And then we have P to the three and Q to the three. Okay, so if we multiply this out, six choose three is six times five times four over three times two times one that's six choose three and then we have times one sixth to the third power times five sixths to the third power and i've run out of room but let's try it oops we have six times five times four over three times two times one we have that times one sixth cubed times five sixths cubed. All right, and if I did this correctly, the probability is not too tiny. I mean, it's possible. It's like one twentieth of the time, right? So zero point or point zero five point zero five four. That's your probability. So a very small percentage. We multiply that by 100, we get the percentage. So it's like 5-ish percent. That is the idea. That's, that's your probability of getting exactly three ones after rolling a die six times using Bernoulli trials, using the, the binomial distribution that you get from those. Okay, so lots of concepts, I know. 
This is a lot of stuff that we pack into a single class because it's like it's the math class to get computer scientists ready to do fancy math. Uh, but you made it. You made it through. We are now at the end. So please let me know. If, I've, if you have any questions at all, come to my office hours before the final. Take your final during my office hours uh, so I can help you uh, if you're confused about a question, you know, understanding it. Uh, yeah, let me know if you have anything that I could do for you uh, before then. And yeah, just good luck. Good luck on the final. I'll see you there if you come to my office hours. And uh, yeah, that is officially all that I wanted to say. That's the end of the class. You made it. So I'll see you during the final.